started a DM because before I had started a DM, I took like a hiatus from drinking. Why don't you just say a break? Why just go? I took a hiatus. Fine, I took a break oh, from right, drinking. Mm. Just put the microphone a bit closer to your mouth. No, I'm gonna move further away now. I know you don't like asshole. stuff close to your mouth, but <laughs> I, 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 I love things in my mouth. Thank you very much. I'm sure you do. I'm not gonna edit that out. <laughs> but yeah, so it's that's just a blooper. Wait, don't, don't, actually, no, that, don't, should, that should be the starting thing. I love things in my mouth. Probably. I'm true. Right. Tell me actually how you started as a bartender. And then we'll move on to the DM phase. Sounds good. So, as you're well aware, as we've spoken about it many times before, you know, I started at the European Bartender School, much like yourself. Absolutely. Did their month-long course, which for me, who was someone who wasn't sure what they wanted to do after high school, like whether I wanted to go into university, I did try college to do a, a higher education course. Yeah. And I found after six months I was not interested anymore it wasn't for me just studying in that kind of format was not how i function well so i heard from a friend about the bartender school because she'd done it previously she said it was a lot of fun and you just get shit faced so i was like is that why you joined it yeah well i joined it because i wanted to learn <laughs> i was like no she's like you learn a lot and you get shit faced so it's it's a it's the best of both worlds. best of both worlds and so i was like cool Plus it was like, in my head, it was like, well, if I like it, then I've now got a practical experience in a job that could last me a long time. Yeah. So I did the course, passed it, went back to Switzerland, came back a month later to do the next course that they offered, which was a, a flare course. So I got a, a yellow certificate. Sorry. I think, yeah, yellow certificate, orange, no, orange, because you got yellow from the first course. So it was white, yellow, oh, orange. I was, about to say, I was about to say purple, but I think purple's the first one, isn't it? No. Purple is like one of the harder ones to get. Are you sure? Yeah, purple you have to have won a competition for. No, no, but that's what I'm saying. Purple was the most prestige one, isn't it? No, no. Most prestigious. Is it black? It is gold. Or black. I didn't even know they had a gold. Gold or black. I, checked, I don't know if I was recording. It's gold or black. <laughs> and not recording. I didn't even know they had actually a gold bloody um I mean, there's there's shaker. A, yeah, there's oh mate, there's so like so many different levels in flair. It's like karate. You know how you yeah, get the I, different levels. I don't know how they do it by that, but yeah. I don't know. Because uh, people maybe, who don't know. It's like karate, you get different coloured belts, but instead of belts, it's shaker tins. But when I was doing EBS, like the there was a guy called Flavius, he was our flair instructor and he really liked flair as well. Mm. He was like Atos. Yeah. Um I can't remember what shaker he was on, but he was very good. Like he was on the top seventeen in the world. And I can't remember but I remember I was talking about the shakers, but I never heard about gold. I think I mean Athos might come on next time and say, actually Sam, you're a complete idiot. There is no gold level. Um But I know like because Tom Dyer, he's considered like there's there is such a thing as gold level bartenders in flair and i believe there's only three in the world and tom dyer is one of them yeah tom dyer is um, good just like the goats he's, like, he's, he's like the godfather of flair, yeah. even though he's not but he's oh. like it uh, my thing was like when i was doing EBS, he's actually correction he's like the Lionel messi of flair right i mean my, my, top tier yes. play, top tier my, my thing is yeah top tier, absolutely up, or maybe the Ronaldinho you know the Ronaldinho used to come up with a lot of new yeah yeah okay the amount of creativity I was incredible and that was one thing like when he just popped in one time and we were doing our EBS course was like oh no it's Tom Dyer Tom Dyer and it's then I remember first time he popped in I had no idea who he was <laughs> yeah. and everyone else in my course was like oh my god it's Tom Dyer like, like, oh, he won he set this set this whole school up who he's incredible at flair and I was like oh wow check the video I went holy shit yeah. <laughs> now when he tries his new tricks yeah like the creativity side you know, I'll give you that is probably the Ronaldinho but yeah going forward you uh, take the EBS course take the EBS course get smashed get smashed pass the course fortunately <laughs> um, mm. how many were you in the course and 32, how many passed I think 32 and 30 passed because the two that didn't pass dropped out 
and that was it. Really? Yeah. Hey, it was like 40 when we started and only 16 graduated. Really? <laughs> I'm not joking. Yeah, yeah no, like my, my course was 32 and then pretty much everyone passed apart from the one guy who dropped out and then the one guy who had, shall we say, learning dif- disabilities. Right. Um, but he, he, he went, like, because obviously you get a second chance to pass it and he went yeah. back and he passed. So in the end, pretty much everyone but the guy who dropped out passed. Yeah. Good for him. There was no one who didn't pass it. That's my grade. I, my grade. But, yeah. I was quite focused actually doing the course. I went out on the um, on the Friday when everyone goes out. Mm. And actually, I had to attend yesterday last time that he actually took everyone out on the first day. And then half the class didn't show up the next day. Yeah, I saw the... But um, no, so we went out on a Friday. And that was the first time I actually went drinking in London and spending my money. Mm. And I, I spent like... I didn't spend that much, but I spent like 90 quid, right? Yeah. And for me, that was like... A lot of money. A, like a lot of money. And... What I used to do is when I was doing the course, I'd like, okay, Monday, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, just get home from the course, study. Um, and, then, and then the weekends. Yeah. You know, when you do your cocktails, the spec test, like every day it was five cocktails. Mm-hmm. Six. Was it six? It was six in mine. Five in mine. <laughs> See, that's probably why your course failed. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so um, what what I used to do was I used to study them. And then the next day before the test, I studied them again. Hmm. And I don't know how, I just started to get a very good way of memorizing them. So I used to just study them on the tube. And then yeah, do the test, same. and it would just be fresh. And it would just work. But yeah, no, I think EBS was really good. That's why I didn't talk with Atos um, about when you join the course. It's really good if you never work behind the bar. And you want to learn, you want to also get involved with all these bartenders. You know, the stories, the good times. The thing as well, it's... If you can't afford the course, just work out, start as a bar back. Because yeah. you can work basically anywhere as a like bar the, back, as long as you want to work. That's yeah. it. If you have the, the willingness and the eagerness to learn and improve in a bar, you can very easily go from bar back to supervisor yeah. within a year. It's not hard. Oh, easy. Easy. And that's where bartenders usually find themselves. Like You can tell someone if they're going to be a good bartender by the way they bar back. Yeah. And also, it's like every... Great bar back will make a great bartender, but not every great bartender will make a great bar back. And I remember there was this bartender that started as a bar back. And I, the reason why he started as a bar back because his English wasn't very good yet. But I just saw him on his first day and he's like washing glasses really fast. And I'm like, damn, <laughs> he's going to be a great bar back. And then all of a sudden... Bartender. Sorry, bartender, you're right. <laughs> and then all of a sudden he's um, like making a... It was like making coffee, right? It was just like a typical double espresso, mm. nothing too crazy. And it gets quiet. And then you ask our supervisor, he goes, oh, let me, can I make a cocktail? And he's like, all right. And he makes this beautiful cocktail. Like he used, um, it wasn't the Nique. It was a kind of rose spirit, egg white, you know, like Hendrix gin. Yeah. He shaped the garnish. Everything was beautiful. All of a sudden the bar supervisor just sees it, drinks it. And he goes, he runs to the manager. He's like, and he's a big guy, the supervisor. And he's mm. like, I want this guy to be a bartender. And then that guy who is now a bartender, who always was a bartender, he was called Mattia. And to this day, he's probably the, my favorite guy to work with behind the bar. The way we'd work together was, oh, it was so good. It's just that, it's not that you just don't have to stay back to around him, but when you're sharing a station and you You're just in sync. Yeah. And it's really good to have. Like with you, it was great. But what I liked, I enjoyed more working with you in different um, apartments because each of us had our our own responsibility and Mm. that would make the entire venue work. Like I didn't have to worry about the bar and you probably didn't have to worry about drunk people. I don't know. (laughs) Well, of course you do. You always have to. I mean, you've always got to be vigilant for them, but most of the time, that was the nice part. Like if I ever said, just get rid of this person. Boom, gone. Yeah. Gone. No. <laughs> yeah. That, that one, I remember that one time the guy just made me lose my cool because he kept just sticking his hands in my glasses. And I was like, mate, I'm making drinks for other people. What are you doing? I'm not even making drinks for you. And you're sticking your dirty hands inside all these glasses. Oh, bro. I remember the time I called you over here. I just went, get this fucking cunt out of this bar. Wait, I was so confused when you told me that because I went, 
What do you mean? Is he trying to get the ice cubes out? Is it too much on his drink? I don't know. It was just... Yeah, I was making Long Island iced teas. Yeah, but he for, just kept for, putting it out. For, for, not even for him, for people on the other end of the bar. And he's just there with these grubby bits going, mm, get that ice out that glass. That's too much ice. I'm like... Oh, you didn't want to have a good instructor? You got one. Yeah. No, that was... <laughs> was yeah, but you've got to be careful when you're kicking people out, mate. I, I have the most embarrassing story ever. So, you know, when you're like, in a busy bar, and most of the time, managers are just collecting glasses. Mm. So I'm trying to collect glasses. And then I see this glass, and I don't know if it's finished or not. And I look at the guy. The guy just looks at me, and he points at the glass, and he goes, it's MD. And I'm like, what? He's like, it's MD, mate. And I'm like, does he even know that I work in? <laughs> so he knows, right. He's on drugs. or he, There's dr- drugs in his drink. So I was like, mate, can you come outside with me for a second? He's like, okay, sure. He's very confused. I said, look, mate, I'm not going to let you back in. And I'm very confused why you're telling me this. He was a Scottish guy. But you can't be telling me you've got drugs on your bloody glass. And he goes, no, mate, it's fucking empty. <laughs> like, I got so embarrassed after that. I was like, I'm oh, sorry, dude. mate. Let me, let, let me get you. <laughs> I've got like two, three drinks after that. The guy laughed at the end of the day. It was a good sport. But, mate, it was so embarrassing. Oh, it's like, he just goes like, proper Scottish, it's fucking empty. <laughs> I'm just looking at him like, oh. They're like, oh dear, right, um, hmm, yes. Have you ever had to cut off a friend? No. I've been cut off by friends because I was a state. Yeah. But I don't think I've ever had to cut someone off. Because normally with people who work in the industry, they know when they're getting... Oh, yeah, massively. Like, they either know they're there or they zoom straight past it without realising because, yeah. you know, they probably haven't eaten or anything. Um, but no, I've never I've never had to be like, your cut off. Jokingly gone like, your cut off. You're not getting served anymore. Yeah, it's every day. Never, never had to intentionally cut someone off. Oh, are you going to cut me off uh, Absolutely when not. I go visit you? Every time you come in. Fantastic. Yeah. So nothing has changed. No. Great. No. Gonna, I'm not going to pour you a drink. I'm going to give you ice cubes and you can suck on those. Day before yesterday. And you know when you're a new bartender, right? Mm. So these guys are there, like, he's doing his free pour test, and when he's like trying to free pour the bottle, and then he like tries to get off, like the bottle hits the shakers, the shakers fall, and look, we've all been there, exactly, we've all been there, exactly. So I remember he was doing it, and like he felt quite bad with it, and I was like, yeah, mate, it's fine. So I just went to him, and it's like that, grab the bottle, the EBS, EBS yeah. sodas, just relax your wrist, turn it, because when you're pouring, you don't want to be like squeezing it, like you just you want to like let it loose, like, the- and then. Hold on. And then I'm like, tell him to do this. He's like, yeah, that's good. And they're like, I'm having a drink with a friend. All of a sudden, I just hear a bottle break. <laughs> like, Don't worry, mate. That's the first of the thousand bottles you're going to break this year. The the worst is not even when you're doing your free pour test. You're pouring a drink. You've made the whole drink. You're literally pouring the last ingredient in, and then you cut. But you cut stupidly, and the next thing you know, you've whacked the drink into your station, and you've oh, got yeah. no drink left anymore, and you've also got to clear away all your ice. Yeah, and you're just like, I mean, like I still to this day do that. Like, I did it two weeks ago. Mm. Now, my my favorite ones that my common mistakes. I haven't got enough time to really go through all of them, <laughs> but no, I think my common mistakes would be. You know, like when one you're of those pouring. cartoons where you, they just unravel the scroll and it just goes on forever. Yeah. Like, oh, I don't I have that many mistakes. No, so, when I started, one of them, which what the guy done as well, was when you're pouring and then you know when you want to get your bottle away, mm. then you just keep hitting the shakers. I done that a lot. Yeah. Um, I remember my first shift working with you, and you know I was a average bartender, I'd say. Well, I'll say it was a. Good bartender. All right, zero out of ten. I'd give myself a seven. Six point five. Seven. <laughs> <laughs> seven. I knew how to make, well because I knew how to make all the cocktails before I even stepped into the bar. Like, I really yeah. studied for it. But I remember I was like, cool. So I was a bit quiet. And then, you know, if you break a bottle, you're not going to get shit for it unless it's like a really expensive bottle. Mm-hmm. Like, it happens. But I broke the worst bottle you could break, not for price, but just of how annoying it is to clean up, which was a bottle of sugar syrup. No. And then the worst thing is when you're new, you want to make a good impression. And then I broke the bottle and then they didn't even let me clean it. And I'm like, oh my God, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> but yeah, that, that was a tough one, to be honest. 
but the good thing is now it's like because now I'm going back to bartending, and I'm going to now work in this bar, which is a very, very, very nice high end bar. And fair enough, I haven't bartended for like two, three years, but you know I'm like I can still do drinks mm. and I do my trial shifts, and you know I'm doing okay. But then I'm watching these bartenders work. And it's like, mate, you are nowhere near their level. Even if, if you took me back two, three years ago, these guys are absolutely on another level. On another level, their knowledge is on another level. Like, and they've got that proper bartender personality, which they just trash talk the whole time, which is so fun. But yeah, that that should be interesting to see though. And I, I've missed it a lot, and it's going to be nice to take a step back from management as well. Mm. Yeah. Also taking a step back from management at the moment, just bartending through Christmas. Did a first shift at a bar I used to work at before. Um, and obviously they've got a lot of new staff starting. The new staff didn't recognize me because obviously they weren't there when yeah. I was bartending, but obviously the, the supervisor knew me from before. So he knows what I'm like. He knows I'm a good bartender. But all these new bartenders see me come on, come in, brand new shirt, like... They're like, oh, another new bartender. Like, I won't, I won't be the worst. And then, like, <laughs> start making drinks. And they're like, oh, <laughs> this guy actually has experience. Like, he he knows what he's doing. And like, one guy, one guy, I told him how to make a, a pisco sour because like, mm, oh, it's not man, on the menu anymore, but it's a classic in that place. Like, one that they've made in the past. So I told him the old recipe, and then once he serves it and he gives it to the customers, he just turns back to me and he goes. I didn't, I didn't realize, but you're like a proper bartender. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah no, mate, I've, I've worked my way from bar back all the way up to management in this, in this bar before. Yeah. Like it's, this is my homestead. Yeah. Even when I joined that venue, I requested to the GM to start as a bar back because mate, it's so important. Like it's very easy when you're making drinks, but when I remember when we were working together and we had a, fucking amazing team back then mm. i remember it was quiet bartenders would just leave the bar and just go collect glasses yeah uh, i remember seth i remember yeah. seth when he was in the dispense like it was a quiet day and then he just grabs all the fruit we bloody have and then he's just chopping everything up seth is one one of the first bartenders that i really really loved watching because oh, seth yeah, was, was very like kind of like a robot his paw was always perfect like it was just so nice to see him work um and then also the, the double shakes i think when you go to cocktail bars everyone's everyone's shake is unique yeah but the double shakes it's beautiful i love to see everyone's double shake his was good um and then you kind of get inspiration from others when i came in and i'd done my double shake you guys just made fun of me yeah, <laughs> so you guys you're, like you're... what is this <laughs> You're trying to wank shake. off two guys at the <laughs> same like, time. <laughs> and the thing is, because you always, like, aimed it at your face, so it was like, mate, what are you doing? I mean, to be fair, like, you have to keep it up here, but, like, everyone has their, their own little nuance, their own little flair to it. And that's yeah. that's what makes makes bartending. Yeah, no, totally. no two shakes, well, okay, yeah, some two shakes are the same, but... Everyone has their their own little their own little yeah. way. Like they, you get taught one way, and then you start working out a way that works best for you. I feel like my my double shake is very unique. Yeah, I don't feel like many people shake the way I shake. A lot of people have even like it's nice when like you're shaking in front of customers, and they go, "You have a really nice shake." Like that as a bartender is just yeah, picks you up. That's what me and Atos were talking about last time. It's. Like you can be shaking and all of a sudden the camera just comes out and they're recording you. And we used to get that. Can I record that. you? Can I record yeah, you? Yeah, we used to get that. I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let it slide. Yeah. Right? But no, it's a great feeling. But also what is great is when, you know, when you go drinking with your team and then you go drinking to other places and you're still you guys and then you watch other bartenders and you're just watching because you like to watch it and you're not there to say, oh, he's making this drink wrong or mm. he's not knowing. You're just going to, you want to see how they do it, what's their style. And I remember we'd done a lot of that. So there was this one night. So we had to play a football match the, the next day against uh, one of the another uh, venues that were part of the same company. <laughs> so I never forget funny this. <laughs> that was so funny. So the day, so the day before the match, I don't know where we probably started in our own venue drinking, and I think we went to the pub, and then we went to be at one. Yeah. And this is the night Marco was really drunk. 
And then he just was pointing at this bloody bottle. And he goes, cut, cut. And it's like this <laughs> overproof rum. Like, so we all do a shot of that. I don't know, we drank quite a lot. And then we go to the football match and we all show up late, hungover. <laughs> we still won, though. <laughs> hey, that was a... Uh... That was funny. Even though the other venue was like, oh, we had to give you one of our players in the beginning. Uh, like, Still. You were down. You right. were down in the beginning. The funniest thing after that football match was like, the minute the game finished, you just see all the bloody waiters just opening their bags, getting the beers out. Like, <laughs> beer, out out beer, of breath beer. and still going for a cigarette. It was so funny. Yeah. No, that was a good... Uh, that and then was we good, ended up in match. another pub. And, uh, I think, yeah, and then did. I think we went to beat at one again. So I don't, I don't... I think I went home after that. You guys probably did. I think we popped into beer one for one. Yeah, that was... Yeah, I got my industry card. Yeah. <laughs> Been in beer one for five years and only like a month ago. <laughs> so this bartender didn't know me, right? Mm. And I asked for a drink. And they said, oh, he works in Dirty Martini. And then he's like, you've got an industry card. And I'm like, nope. And I don't want one. <laughs> he was like, well, you're getting one. I'm like, all right, I guess it was time. <laughs> so we got someone to take a picture of me, <laughs> like uh, getting the industry card. But no, it was a uh, fun, fun, fun times. And it's still going to be a lot of fun. I think this Christmas is going to be really interesting. Oh, yeah. But <clears throat> that's what I was going to ask you. So I think Christmas will be Christmas. But then after January, a lot of places, bars, restaurants, they're going to be overstaffed. Oh, and I absolutely. Think, and I think now they're, we're finally going to get into that transition that you're only going to get what you want. You're not just going to hire someone for hiring. Yeah. So I think hospitality will make a comeback like that and you'll see like everyone's going to be a lot more appreciative of it and now you can't just have no experience and be a bartender yeah so a lot of people are going to learn so much from this christmas this christmas is going to be bloody great that that was probably one of the i'm not one of the worst things i'd say but post covid one of the least enjoyable things about being a supervisor or a bartender was the fact that you were having people join the bars who had zero experience. You weren't even going into the bar back role first. They were coming yeah. straight to the bar. And then they like they weren't appreciative or didn't understand why they had to work so hard. Because yeah. they hadn't seen anyone else do it first. Nothing, or, mate. or put the effort in as a bar back. Yeah. I think one from what I remember, you know when you were a bar back, right? Mm -hmm. And then the first shift you have as a bartender you feel that pride and honor in putting on that bartender shirt. Yeah. In places that, you know, have different codes for the shirts. But I remember it used to be like a great satisfaction. I remember seeing so many bar backs all of a sudden we're in the changing room and they just put on that bartender shirt and they're so proud to have it on. So what happened with the and pandemic? And you know, it's because most of the time, like the bartenders weren't told when you were promoted. Yeah. You would just come in in that blue shirt and all the bartenders would look at you and like, Ooh, oh, he's a bartender yeah. now, big man. Exactly. But I think when a lot of people got confused, I think this is something that we should talk about uh, quite thoroughly is about the pandemic. So when lockdown happened, okay, we're all at home. When things reopen, most everything's kind of still the same the way we work, like mm -hmm. not with the restrictions, but the bartenders, the drinks and everything. Yeah. Because at the time, people are struggling to get a job as well. Yeah. And then for me, when it all changed, it was Freedom uh, Day. So when we were open already, but then all of a sudden the economy's opening up, the demand is absolutely ridiculous. Mm. Brexit is actually now in effect. In effect. So that was a very bad combination. And then what happened was this is why 99% or even 99.9% .9 of uh, establishments in hospitality struggled with staff turnover, just quality of staff they were getting. Because, you know, look, every time we had new staff, they were all from. Eastern Europe, or just Europe yeah. in general, you would rare, rarely get an English bartender or an right, English right. bar back. I mean, the uh, first bar I started in, 80% Italians. Yeah, same. Mine was Italians, Hungarians. 80% um, Italians. We get Polish. Me and one other English person. No, sorry, two other English people. Yeah. And then the rest were others. Yeah, when I started, they were all Italian or Hungarian. Literally, that was it. But So what happened was, then all of a sudden you have all these job openings and people are just looking for a job. And then people, uh, yeah, I could do bartending. And they kind of lost like what we loved about it, like passion of it, the working hard, 
And they thought it was like, just go to a bar and make drinks, which it wasn't. And this, I'll say now, it was the worst time ever in hospitality. Like mm. the amount of people, because a lot of people you get with people in uni and they don't really care and they don't even need the job to pay the bills. So exactly, because the amount of people they're... that would call in sick, the amount of people that just wouldn't even show up to interviews. You'd book a hundred interviews, five Three or ten would show up. up. Yeah. Like that is literally like five to ten percent of interviews would show up. And then ten percent of those ten percent would actually get the job. Mm. So that was really hard for everyone. And like you know it better than anyone how much it was a struggle. Now, with that being said, yes, it was very stressful and a very difficult time for us. But it also has made us be very good with the managing and the training new people. And I think now post-COVID bartenders, when they're going to be learning with pre-COVID bartenders, they're going to be actually quite comfortable. Mm. And I think they'll feel a lot more support than previously. Although I think you need the tough love when you are starting to bartend. But yeah, I I think we are going to go in a very good direction. I think that there's already markets to be bartenders. Um, Fairing's getting popular again. Cocktail competition is starting to go up. London Cocktail Week was really popular. Like just random random people were saying like, Oh, we're here for London Cocktail Week. And they're not even bartenders. Yeah. Yeah. Only issue with London Cocktail Week this time was tube strikes. Yeah. I remember the, the place I was working in, we we cancelled our, our London Cocktail Week cocktail specials that we were doing just because... Oh, you were doing specials? Yeah. We 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 had a whole range of like different Negronis and then we ended up having to cancel because no one came in. Because we, where I was working, it was very... Not touristy. It was more yeah, it's quite business corporate. work. It was just corporate, you know. So all these corporate people who were normally coming in to work weren't coming in because of the two tracks. They were all remote working, which one is another downfall of the hospitality industry, this remote working, because then it means no one is forced to come central London anymore. Yeah. Look, I realised a lot of that as well. Like, one of the best things about our job is the way we get to interact with customers. And you know when, like, we used to do this, these cocktail classes mm. where we'll take customers behind a bar, like, 10 of them, they're all booked. Yeah. And they'll, like, make these two cocktails. And I used to love doing them. They were really fun and engaging. And then with the pandemic, we started doing them over Zoom. And I still love doing it. It was one of my favorite things to do. I used to do, like, once a week or sometimes twice a week. And I love doing it. But then you got to kind of realize, like, it's got to be fun and engaging. But then some of the groups you're getting, because these are mostly companies. Like, a lot yeah. of them are just, like, a group of family members. Yeah. Or you can have just like these girls in their early 20s who just want to have that cocktail, catch up with friends. Or you're going to have these lawyers, which are the worst ones you could have for cocktail class because they are so serious. <laughs> like, um, oh God, what was it? So when it became a part of pouring, um, we were doing an espresso martini. And I think I told them to pour um, half of the bottle of uh, vodka. And this guy just poured the entire bottle. <laughs> And his name was Drake. And I was like, okay, it looks like Drake knows how to party. And then everyone just quiet. Like every single lawyer is just quiet. Like we're just doing this. No comment. And I'm like, tough crowd. <laughs> so there's another new like lawyers. Actually, like, you're not in court. You're with a bartender. Like, you can up. tell, you can tell me what kind of partying you do. I'm not going to use it as evidence against you. It's like probably done the same or worse. So like. No, the worst part is when we, we done the cocktail, and, you know, we have a try, and everyone's like, oh, that's nice, or oh, it's a bit too sweet. All of a sudden, I try it, and I'm like, all right, guys, what do we think? And then everyone's just like, not a word, they're just like, I'm like, okay. It was meant to last like an hour. That cocktail class lasted like for 25 minutes because you just had no interaction with them. Mm. But no, that's the type of people you meet. Like, my favorite is Americans. I love having American customers and you have time to talk with them. They're so fun and enthusiastic. Especially like, yeah, it's true. Americans, when they come over to London, very, very yeah. happy, very much. Oh, wow. It's great to be here. No, and then you get good. like the, the English people. Can you just hurry up and make my drink, please. I hate <laughs> yeah. my life. <laughs> just, I'm just here to drown it in sorrow. That's true. So, That's why we've got pubs everywhere. <laughs> Favorite. But we need this. Oh, it's a favorite, stressful favorite city. For that, though, it's like you could tell someone didn't want to have to wait a while for their drink, but they didn't know what they wanted to drink, so they'd ask you for a recommendation. And obviously, you remember the Rock My Rhubarb. Great drink to give someone who's not expecting it. Yeah. But 
I'm Long not drink. making it. Easy right, pause. <laughs> it's either Just 50 in. or 30. <laughs> yeah, no. 50, yeah. Yeah, true. it was 50 or 30, yeah. Yeah. Easy, easy measurements. Now, I liked making that drink, but now, if I would go back to when that cocktail was on happy hour, I know, can I get it around my room? Because like, you got to go, like, get three bottles and you pour it at the same time. But no, it was a great cocktail. Um, I was speaking with this bartender yesterday, and he was telling me about this. I'm going to get a few ingredient wrongs, but the cocktail he described reminded me of um, one of my favorite ever cocktails created by Mr. Matt Greenwood, which was the rum latte. So for people who don't know, rum latte was a cocktail that would have Kahlua, correct me if I'm wrong, Kahlua, yeah. Gosling, yeah. creme cacao, white Mozart, espresso. Yeah. Yeah. And then That's chocolate it. shavings on the top. And yeah. chocolate bitters. And chocolate bitters. I believe so. Yeah, dash. Two, two dashes of chocolate bitters. Yeah, like, I love that cocktail. So this bartender, Andrew, was telling me like a similar cocktail, but with amaretto, a lot more like, mm. he'd go very, very into detail with it. And then he's saying how he'd prepare it. And I'm like, bloody hell, that would be really, really nice. And um, I said in the last podcast in um, Atsy Power Station Control Room B, they've got a similar one. Like, there's this thing about coffee and chocolate that just goes so well together. And even like with amaretto, I know you can't, <laughs> drink most of it but yeah coffee and chocolate do go very well together but i do think it's also you have to be spot on with the measurements yeah because otherwise it's so i saw yesterday it's not niche Neg- enough i saw Neg- i hate it well i hate campari that's why i don't like negroni but i saw yeah. a negroni sour interesting very interesting i would never drink that because i hate negroni well, was, this is this page on Instagram. Just a page on Instagram? Yeah, no, but this guy is very, like... Did it have the, 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 the specs underneath of how you would make uh, it? No, like, it shows you how to make everything. Like, okay. Yeah. And he's, like, he's, you can tell he's a proper bartender. His cocktails yeah. look amazing, but the, the quality, and you can tell he knows what he's doing. He's probably not American. <laughs> but I, I've got nothing wrong. So I've got mm. nothing against American bartenders, but... Ounces are not proper measurements. Exactly. And half a cup's like, no. We're very precise in Europe, and this is how it's meant to be, because five milliliters to ten milliliters will change your drink completely. Just our super sour. Of course. So that's still quite Five ml of too much of super sour, and you ruin your drink. Yeah. But, but there are great bars in America, and I will go there one day, but it's just that's like, ah, oh, do I really have to use these ounces and cups? So, but, to be fair, the only cocktails in America that I ever had, I don't remember. Because I got so drunk that night. So drunk. Fair enough. God. Do you know what? I think a lot of bartenders, when they drink, they do go quite crazy. But I was actually telling you this before we started. All right. I didn't do it on purpose. So if you get pizza coming, uh, I didn't know. So typical night out drinking, probably a Tuesday or Monday when you do. You know when you're the opening bartender and you have like, next bartender that's in like you're finishing at 8 and the other mm-hmm. one's finishing at 10 and you're like oh should we go for drinks oh, I'm only finishing at 10 I'll wait for you so you stay in the bar you're drinking until they come out so then you're already kind of half tipsy so I remember that happened we went out drinking and before you know it, it's like 1am you're drunk you want to go home so I go walk towards uh, Holborn to catch my bus then I really need to pee and it's dark <laughs> It's night time, but I really need to pee. And, you know, when you're a man, you don't care where you go as long as no one sees you. So this is, <laughs> so this is really bad, actually. Oh, so <clears throat> I'm, like, desperate. My bus is coming in 10 minutes. I can't wait. So I go to this corner, and I start to pee. But when I start peeing, I just see something fly just next to me. <laughs> I thought, like, what the hell was that? And then I just see a pigeon. Soaked in my piss. <laughs> oh, and he actually didn't fly away. He just stayed next to me whilst well, I was yeah, peeing. It's night time. He can't see. At least I warmed him up. Right? But, <laughs> no, but you know, that was so bad. I felt so sorry for the pigeon. But I shat myself. Like, can you imagine? You're going for a pee and all of a sudden a pigeon just flies out. It was like a magic trick gone wrong. Wait, it was so... <laughs> it was That's like... a good thing you didn't like turn when he flew. <laughs> you just kept peeing on him. I freaked out. I'm surprised I didn't pee on myself. Yeah. No, I mean, I've got so many drunk stories, man. Fortunately, none of my drunk stories end in peeing on an animal, so. I don't know. Do you know what? When you're on your fourth Jameson, 
Because you're a big Jameson and Co. Mm. type of guy. Yes. Do you have Jameson and ginger ale? No. I'm not a fan of ginger ale or ginger beer. Yeah, Mainly because I'm not a fan a of strong. ginger itself. Mm. Not a fan. Although I tried a ginger sour, ginger whiskey sour the other day. Ooh. It's actually all right. I thought, because I'm making it for the new specs that I have to learn. Mm-hmm. And I thought, it's going to be rubbish. Don't like ginger. It's not going to be my type of drink. Give it a little taste. Ooh. Well, that's actually quite, that's actually quite good. It's not that, it's not half bad. There so I was like, save that one for later. <laughs> Take the ice out, put that in the fridge. I'll have that after shift. Mate, I had, um, there was this uh, cocktail that me and this bartender called James, I call him Baby Shark. He used to always put Baby Shark on when we were closing, which is fucking annoying. So we were working in the bar and it wasn't that busy. And he had the ticket for a chocolate martini and a classic daiquiri. So he's got two shakers here. And I'm like doing my support role, which is my favorite thing to do. It's like if the bar back needs help, you help the bar back. If the mm. bartender needs help with the cocktails, you help doing cocktails, whatever. So I'm like on this edge, like he needs help, he needs help. So I go see him and I'm like, okay, you need these two cocktails. And he was halfway through making one already. I think he already done the daiquiri. And I grabbed it and then I'm like, oh, it's quiet. He knows what he's doing. And then I don't know how subconsciously I just swapped the shakers. So then... He's pouring then all the ingredients of the chocolate martini into the daiquiri, right? Oh. And then he starts shaking it, and he's like shaking with all. He's like, that doesn't feel right, but he carries on shaking. And then, That's too heavy for one drink. Yeah, two glasses. And then the first one he pours was the one he was very curious about. So he pours supposed to be daiquiri, and it's like about five, ten ml of water. And he's like, he orders the other one, and he's like, great. And then he calls me. He's like, thanks for swapping my shakers. And then I was like, oh, shit, might be good. And we try it. And it wasn't really that bad. I would give that drink a 7 out of 10. Seriously. Strawberry classic daiquiri. daiquiri. Classic daiquiri with a chocolate martini. It's not that bad. Yeah. Like, it it was quite it interesting. Wouldn't, it wouldn't be that bad. It's just rum with, with some lime and sugar mixed into chocolate. Yeah, but you, lime and chocolate. Wait, wherever do you hear that? Not very often, to be fair. No. But like I said, it was a very nice surprise. A lot of surprises happen. Surprises are always yeah. nice and fun. But we were going on about it. So when you go out for drinks, like what's your go-to cocktail or go-to drink? Go-to drink. A lot drink. of bartenders don't really drink cocktails unless it's like Negronis. Go-to drink, as you said earlier, it's definitely a Jameson's with Coke. Um, go for it. Go-to cocktail. So it was just a classic whiskey sour. For me. Classic. Classic whiskey sour. Do you have egg white or no egg yes. white? Yes, yes, egg white. So I need the egg white. Egg white doesn't affect flavour. It well, affects texture. Makes a drink more creamy. Do you know who ever made my first ever whiskey sour? Hey. My sister. Your sister. Yeah, this was about That's why you don't like him? <laughs> no. no. this was like five, six years ago. So she was working in this uh, mission style restaurant as a bar back. Mm. And we were like in Portugal at the time. And then she was just going to make, and this is when I wasn't even into bartending, but she made the whiskey sour and it was just for my mum and dad. But I tried it and I was like, it's really nice. And to this day, it just, that one still for me tasted really nice. And I always prefer to have it without the egg white for a whiskey sour. Um, but sours are interesting though. Yeah. One thing that I don't, like, look, if you don't like a spirit, you can't drink it. So, for example, I can't drink a Negroni because it has two things I really don't like, gin and Campari. Fair enough. Now, I still can't really drink a Boulevardier because that Campari is quite intense. But what I realized was when I was working one time in this bar, I asked for a, uh, they were doing a Negroni. I said, oh, let's have a Boulevardier. And I was making it and I'd done it, you know, on the rocks. Mm. It's meant to be done. I was like, no, mate, you should do it neat in a coupe. And I was like, Really? Like it's going to completely change your perspective of the drink. And I tried it neat, and it was like a completely different cocktail. But I, I had no idea how much a drink could change if it's served on the rocks or neat. You know, for 20-year-old me, it was looking like, whoa. It's like, like margaritas. Most people prefer it in a martini glass or a coupe, whichever way it's served. Yeah. But then you've got the the niche crowd that like it over, over ice. Mm. Definitely not one of my favorite drinks, 
But I think if I was going to drink it, I'd probably drink it neat. Yeah, uh, this is what we were talking about in the pilot. My Americans, they uh, our margarita are very different than theirs because you like in their work office they have these like margarita Fridays, and you just see a big jug mm. of like green, and we're like, what the hell is that? But it's margarita mix. That's what that is. Exactly. So that's why it's we're bad. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's, I've, I've been to America. I had it. It's bad stuff. That's what got me so effed up. Well, there you go. But it's great to have the nice mix of, you can have the sweetness or not, but it's still not what you're really looking for. It's not going to record it anyway. Uh, but I think as well, when you're having a cocktail that's not meant to have sugar, it's, and you put sugar on. Yes. No. I don't know. It's like, okay. So Americans like can. things sweet. Yeah. That's, that's their whole culture. Okay. Everything is sweet. It's, you're really the wrong person to ask this, but like the espresso martini. Yes. I know you don't like it. No. But you kind of get the I sense get, to it. I get it. Yeah. It's meant to be more bitter than anything. Yeah. Like, so my, my point with the espresso martini is like, I don't put sugar in my coffee. Mm. I used to, but I decided not to. And it's changed my whole perspective of coffee. And like my favorite espresso martini, actually the one I made yesterday on my trial shift, um, Actually, no, I just done it pretty straightforward. I just done a bit of amaretto. But my perfect one would be Dash of Babies, 10 of amaretto, 15 Kahlua. Dash of Babies, that's, that's but a no good mix. Yeah, but I tried to do more Babies, but it, it wasn't as good as I was expecting. And even like with rum, uh, so again, this bartender is bloody good. Andrew sent me about what rum to use for an espresso martini. And the, the bar I'm going to go work, it's absolutely amazing. And the creativity that you're allowed... But you could select a cocktail and you could change what spirits you're going to put inside it just on the till. Oh, and that's you know, really good. And you know how much a bartender's... They would I mean, like, if, if I worked there, I'd be like... Because you know a lot of times like, people go, oh, could you make like a porn star martini, but instead, can you put Grey Goose? And you're like, listen, mate, I can't. It's going to affect the stock. I'm going to get the shit from the boss. Like, it's like, I can, but I have but, to then charge you the martini price. And the Grey Goose. So that way the stock yeah. levels stay the same. Yeah. Um, another thing I was going to ask you, which is, and you're very good with it, because you're very good at making people feel very welcome. Ranks to bartenders. <sighs> so much fun. So much fun. So I've got a good story with you, but what was the greatest prank you've pulled off? Probably wouldn't say it is the greatest prank, but the one that I enjoyed the most was my ongoing prank war with Marco. Oh. And it was basically... Yeah, when well, he nearly blind someone. It's no, a no, 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 I'm not talking about that. Not, that's, that's a story for another episode. I am talking about when Marco used to leave his key fob on the bar, so that way when he went home, he didn't lose it. So <laughs> every time it. I started before him or he left before I did and he left it on the bar, that meant game on. I'm hiding it somewhere brand new. That was actually very fun. Yeah, I there were, that. And then there were times where I'd like accidentally leave my bar blade or something like on the bar that you need for everyday use. And so he would just then go, oh, well, that's Sam's. I'm hiding that back. So I think the, the and obviously like I wouldn't be too mean about it. I'd hide it and then send a photo clue to him and be like, good luck finding this one. And I think my favorite one was when I climbed up onto the bar and I just put his key on top of the security camera. So wait, which one? The one by the, the entrance? The one by the the the, the back the back the back door into the back house. That was a good one. I remember another I good spot. It, you I hit put it. it up there, and he he I come in and he's like, still hasn't found it, and he's like, mate, what the fuck is my key? And I'm like, it's always watching over you, mate. <laughs> <laughs> and he's just like, the hell does that mean? And so he eventually he. I just told him where it was, but the getting the security footage from the camera of him just like going up there, like face, right. face right in the camera. It was just you so told funny. You me that story because I, I didn't think about the story for years, but I remember because I was quite new when you guys started doing that and I thought it was quite entertaining. But the worst one you've done to me, and I hated it. I mean, we've done a lot of pranks on each other, but this was like Sunday, so it was deep cleaning day. Most of us are probably hung over and I was cleaning the bottle display and, you know, no, no, I wasn't using a ladder. I was just on top of the bath, I think. And 
Sam likes the prank because you're a bit of a cunt. Um, <laughs> I mean, all of a sudden, you grab proper scoop of crushed ice, like a proper scoop, like you're about to make a bloody frozen cocktail. And then you don't get my trousers open. You actually bloody open my trousers and my boxes and you shove it right in there. It's just a lucky grip. Mate, it's what just do you lucky, lucky grip? It's Mate. just lucky grip. I just put my hand and It's because you I always wear a belt. Mate, I remember I just was like, and then I go to the back of house area and it's so cold and then it gets in and then I clench. And that was the worst thing I've ever done in my life, mate. I probably even have scratches of it. It was so bad. But it's very important to do pranks. What I do... Uh, is it brings people into the fold. Like someone who's, who's on the outside, like he starts, they stay, or he or she, they start to feel a bit more comfortable. Yeah. Um, And you get people who are quiet being more more open, bring, coming more confident and you know, yeah. just showing a bit more of their own personality, which and you see, you want to at have the end of the it. day is is all you're trying to get to do with just to know your colleagues and who they are. Yeah, some might take it as bullying, but I think they they're, they're not seeing the big picture of it. I, my my favourite, you know, is the typical like, oh, can you count the coffee beans for us? And I've had someone who did count. Uh, <laughs> this guy Benji, Benji done a great prank on a bartender. He said, I think you heard the story where he needed to. So the way we do a stock count, we had this like. Uh, barcode scanner and he said like you need to scan every single product we have and apparently this bartender was doing it for ages it was such a funny prank from benji i loved it it was one of my favorite pranks. but one i used to love doing and this is what i used to do in the restaurant was so when you have the coffee machine and when you take the old coffee uh, out the fake brownie yeah so when you so for people who don't know when you take the old coffee off the handle and you bang it out a lot of times the coffee will look perfectly in a nice um, circle shape where it looks like a brownie so I used to get a lot of people who were coming in late I'm like alright let's teach him a lesson so I'm not going to mention his name but I'm going to give his nickname so Dr House it was the last hire I think I've ever made for the bar of my old place but he was, he was quite good you do whatever you ask him to do but he used to always come late so I one time I get the coffee I put it on a plate it comes out perfect I'm like, let me go more into detail. I get mayonnaise, I put mayonnaise all around it, I put rose petals. So it looks like this nice creamy chocolate brownie. And then I've got a plate and a spoon. And then I look at him and I just walk past. And he's like, what's that? And I'm like, I'm not going to tell him. But then I'm like, look, I shouldn't be giving you this. This is the new special of our desserts, all right? Try it, but don't tell anyone I'm giving this to you. He's like, cool. So he gets a spoon, and he gets a spoon just a coffee, but then he gets the mayonnaise as well. <laughs> it was so funny. He, he was like 20 minutes putting his mouth under water, and every day I saw him, he like, he never came late again. Mm. I did, did the, the same thing to when I worked in a restaurant. Had this one bartender, she always came late. And every, every time, like we used to have a little plate of brownies to go with hot drinks. So the oh, brownie nice. would be cut up into small little cubes. Every day she'd come in late, walk straight to the brownies, grab a piece, eat it. So one day we swapped the brownies with coffee. Yeah. Chop them up, put, put not just one there. We put a bunch of them. So it looks like there's a lot of, a lot of pieces. She comes in, grabs it, hum. <laughs> Almost throws up at <laughs> the pass in the on the bar, but man, she uh, from that day forward she she always came in on like she was quite late often, but yeah. she never came in directly to the brownies and ate a piece. She always come in and be like oh, brownie safe. Do you know funny? You know when people come in late and they get a bit used to it. Or my favorite is when they come like two minutes before they open and they clock themselves in before they like even get changed. Mm. So I was a, I was assistant, I was AGM at the time. <laughs> this waiter, she comes to me, it's like 3.59 or something. She was thinking I have four to close. And she goes, I'll keep talking me in. I was like, hey, it's starting, man. Like, no. You're not in uniform. Oh. You're not even ready to work. No, you're not getting nah, clocked in but, early. But I feel like this is why I really can't wait until we get a lot more. And I'm already seeing a lot of people becoming bartenders. Like they don't realize how fun our job is at times like yes it's really hard work the friday saturdays will be intense but then once you're done you could go home and you rest knowing you've done a great job or you're going to go out and have a lot of fun and this is why a lot of us became bartenders it was like from how we started it, like throwing house parties 
in our house. I used to, I used to think my kind of parties in my house would suck. Everyone said they were great. Mm. And I realized I would never really enjoy my parties because I was just making sure, okay, we've got enough drinks, we've got enough food, is this clean? And then I, you know, you kind of get like organizing your own venue. The one that got me more into it, which is what I wanted to tell you was, was my 17th birthday. Yeah, you better drink an energy drink because this is about to get real. It was probably one of my best birthdays ever I've ever had. So I wake up, it's like 10.30, it's my birthday, and I had family and friends coming to my house. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then I was 17. I already had, I, I was already like drinking on occasion, right? But it was that, you're a teenager. If you drink, you just want to get drunk. I'm like, it's my birthday. I go to the fridge. I get a beer at 11 a.m. It's my birthday. <laughs> hey, even so, even so, like. Anyway. So, um, I remember like, I have one or two friends showing up. And then I'm just, so in Portugal, we have uh, some beers, what we call like minis, which they're 200 ml beers. Okay. And they're very small. And we, I'm just drinking that. And then more people show up. And I had a quite a nice house back then. So in our in our garage, we had like a ping pong table. had like foosball in my bedroom. So more people come. A lot of us are playing like foosball. And we're drinking. And then when everyone starts to come, or well, my friends, we go to the garage. And then we're like playing our music out loud. And then we're playing um, beer pong. And at this point, I realize how drunk I am. Oh, dear. So... And I've got a family there as well. So I'm playing beer pong. And then when I'm not playing, I go into the house. And then I'm like drunk as hell because you're 17 and you get drunk very easy. And I'm trying to talk to my uncle or my cousins, just like bogging my head back and forth. Oh, After dear. all this, I get too drunk. I get really too drunk that all of a sudden I get so drunk. I just remember I had I only had like my shorts on. And then I just decided to hide inside my cupboard. <laughs> and then... Someone opens my cupboard and then I see them, I scream and I grab a shoe covering my nipples. <laughs> Whoever's like a very good friend of mine back in the day, they still got this picture of me. And anyway, I get very drunk. It's my birthday. They sing my birthday. I eat a bit of cake and then we go upstairs. I get really sick to the point that I go straight to the toilet. Now, this is why I will never uh, only puke in the actual toilet, not in the sink. Because this is this is a very disgusting story, by the way. So I'm not sure I, I want to hear it. Then. Well, people need to know, people Sam. To know. <laughs> so, Actions have consequences. Wait, right, this one was absolutely disgusting. Don't drink before twelve I pm on the sink. Now I didn't, and I had the tap on as well. I didn't realize that my puke was clogging the sink, so it's all coming up. I'm like, it's okay. My dad taught me how to unblock a uh, pipe, so. I open the cupboard underneath. I see the pipe. I'm opening the pipe. It's okay. I've got a bucket to help me with this. But the bucket is only like 20% of what's actually there. <laughs> so I do it also. It's a massive mess. I don't even know who cleaned it to this day, but they cleaned it. And then this is like, this is like 11, 11.30, probably my mum. I'm in my bed. I'm drunk. I just want to go to sleep. I'm, and then all of a sudden, my dad does the worst thing ever when you're drunk and you're cold. He just grabs my covers. He rips it off. I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like, you're going out tonight. I said, no, no. He's like, yes, you are. All your friends are going out. You're going out. So my dad tries to sober me up. So I go to the kitchen. And then I'm like, just throwing up when you got nothing there. And it's like, he's giving me coffee, seven up chocolate. Eventually, I'm okay. Great. We go out. And then we get to the place where we all go out, which is like quite close to the beach. You've got four or five bars there. So I get there. And I need to go to the toilet to make a poop. <laughs> now, there's only one place you can go for a poop. It's actually in the beach because they've got like this kind of bar there and they've got these toilets. So I remember I went to the toilet and I had my friend Danny was with me. And then all of a sudden I'm walking and I would go into the clubs with toilet paper on me. Go there, get drunk again, throw up again. Like it was a very, very interesting 17th birthday. Mm. It sounds, to be honest, your dad's a bad influence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. 
That's 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 what it was. I'm pissed off at you for throwing up in the bathroom and doing what you get out of my house. You get the fuck out of this house right now. Mate, my 18th birthday was funny because in Portugal we have a great thing, which is back in the day, if it was someone's birthday, we'd always go to these like restaurants where you pay 10 euros and you get starter, main, dessert. Actually, probably not even the starter, but you get main and the dessert. That's what you need. In Portuguese, so you need to get a coffee and wait for it. Not bottomless, unlimited beer and sangria. And not like the rules you have in London where oh, you've got to finish your drinks. No, mate. I remember I went to one of these dinners and this guy just had a jug of beer and he just downed it. And the guys, they just bring another one. I don't know how they make a profit from it. But either way, this is what we used to always do. So maybe, maybe it's because they just go through such high volume of customers. It has to be. I'm, like, I'm guessing you, everyone just goes. And you can six. make a disaster in their toilets. They don't care. They, they expect it. So well, I mean, if you're if you're serving unlimited yeah, alcohol yeah, like enough. that, you can't not expect that. Like, like, oh, can you believe it? That little bloody eighteen year old just throwing up in the bathroom. No, it's that little eighteen year old. No Do you know what? He, he, he lasted. No he lasted ideas. more drinks than we thought he was gonna. That's probably it. They probably bet on it. Like, oh, oh, got some eighteen year olds in. Yeah. Which one do you think will go first? I keep knocking everything. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Yeah, nothing's full. Yeah. Right. So it was on my 18th birthday, and then we go to do this thing, and then I'm doing okay because you, know, you get used to it at one point. And as long as you just stick with beer, and then all of a sudden, oh, let's get shots of Vito. You know, shots are a euro. Fair enough, mate. I had like three, four shots. I, I, I actually sour shots. Like, no, nah, mate. This is like some Portuguese like uh, spirits. <laughs> uh, okay, I had port wine as a shot which is not that bad. But then I had um, something we call um, Aguardente, which is like the Grappa of Portugal, right? Okay. Or the Palinka of Portugal. So I had these shots, and this one actually start, I black out. The only thing I remember was me texting my mum saying, can you pick me up? I'm very drunk. <laughs> this is midnight. And then I wake up the next day, and apparently I still went to the clubs. I like got a rose for my best friend. like. But yeah. I don't know. That's why I now took a break for my birthdays because they get quite intense. Yes. Yes. Once you pass the sweet age of like, let's say 24, 25, yeah. birthdays yeah. start taking a toll on you. Especially if you if you party like you did when you were 18. Yeah. But that was great though. Um, another good thing we used to do was when we, because you know I'll be out one night. So we got the industry card there. <laughs> I know when you would have a lot was when all of a sudden you'd hug me, then you slap me. And Sam slaps you because you know you've had too much. <laughs> but you're right, Sam. <laughs> I love you, mate. I love you. Slap. Which one of us has had too much? Probably me. No. Oh, yeah. no. It was fun. It was really good times. But yeah, like a hundred more stories like this. And I know a hundred more will come. But great things as well is when you see your customers getting drunk like this. And we don't, some bartenders get annoyed when their when their staff, sorry, when their customers are drunk. But it's okay to see if they're being okay. It depends but, on the level of drunk they are and yeah. the kind of drunk they are. Yeah. Like one thing I'm going to get out of the way right now, which this is not for bartenders, this is for like people who are not bartenders. If you go to a bar and you break a glass, that is fucking okay. Don't feel like you need to pay us or like don't feel so guilty. It's absolutely fine. Like how many times? How many times have you done it? I'll I'll say this: you break it once, it it's fine. You break it twice, still fine. You break it the third time, it's on the edge of being okay. Who the fuck the fourth, have you been serving? The fourth <laughs> and the fifth time, I have to come back to your table to clean up a broken glass. You better start paying me. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Because I, I remember the, the one time, time yeah, on like probably like a fifth or sixth shift as a bar back, literally for this one table I had, I'd get called over. Bam, Sam, table five, broken glass, cool, head over. The first one. I walk, literally walk back to the bar again over the radio. Sam, table five, another broken glass. Okay. Shh, back, clean it up. Walk back to the little bar again. Literally, like, it was not even, like, five-minute gaps between these glasses breaking. I ended up going back Jesus. to this table five or six times. And then I just looked at the manager, and I went, if they break one more glass, I'm not coming back over here. You can clean up, and you can kick them out. 
and then I walked back to the bar and I had a glass break and I just, just, <laughs> I just took the earpiece out of my ear. I just looked at the manager and I went like that. And he went, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's quite annoying. But you're good as well. It's when, okay, we're Barton and not what we're doing, but when you're like doing your, you got a party and you want to do your own events, then you get your own, um, you hire your own people to do that. And a lot of them, they are ready for everything. Because a lot of people who work in private events, they know what they need to go through. It's what we like about the mercenaries. It's the mercenaries group is when they do their private events, like I was speaking at us about it is, mate, they all say, we've got nothing. We want you to not just Barton, but get everything. And then you'll see like them with like a hundred kilos of ice and they'll get all the beers and all that. And then you just see them operate the entire way from start to the beginning. And even, so they had these cleaners, right? Doing, um, in case something would break. Yeah. And guess who, when there was a broken glass, guess who would be the first one to clean it? The bartenders. That's why I love the mercenaries a lot. Like they're bloody good with that stuff. And um, I'm happy to work with them as well because they're part of this. So if anyone wants to inquire about the mercenaries, even though they are very, very, very busy and they're not taking all the requests, but you're always happy to inquire to, the link will be in the description below. And um, they'll probably do my birthday as well, actually, next year. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I might not even celebrate my birthday properly. I don't know. What we'll was see. in the park? That was Valerie's birthday. No, I'm saying next year. Not talking about a birth, any birthday. I'm talking about your next birthday. Hire the mercenaries, get a section in the park. Of yeah, the park probably. The park. I'd probably do it a month earlier because I'm like in the beginning or uh, end of September. So it'd be nice to get a bit of a different taste to it. I just got a message from the mercenaries, funny enough. <laughs> That's cool. But yeah, um, well, look, before we shoot off, thanks a lot for coming, Sam. Thank really do welcome. appreciate it. So where do you think it's going to be now the future of bartending? in three, let's say two years from now. I can see it going one or two ways. Right. Either it goes back to how it was pre-COVID, you know, you get passionate bartenders in again, people who care about the industry and are not just doing it as a part-time job for their uni work, that they don't really care about that much because yeah. at the end of the day, they once they've got their university degree, that's it. They're no longer, but they're going to bartend. Yeah. Or it could just go that the way the economy is going at the moment, like it's just not viable to earn a living off making drinks anymore. That's a very dark, dark way I see it going. Uh, and that there's, there's no, and like, unless, cause you know, people complain at the moment, like what pints are, in central London, pints are six or yeah, seven now pounds. Six to seven, yeah. Cocktails are going from eight pounds when we first started to now they're 10, almost 12 pounds. Like, they don't understand, like this, yeah, the inflation and all that stuff. Yeah, they don't know people. the running cost of it. Like, yeah. look, yes, it's bloody annoying when you're paying 12 pounds for a cocktail, but then you got to see how much our bartender is getting paid. Like, a lot of them have kept the prices the same, but the speed of service has changed completely. Like people always think it's like, oh, that cost me a bottle of beef eater cost me like fifteen pounds in a shop, and I'm paying ten pounds for here. You're absolutely right. But look how much we need to run. Like the back of house, the now with the bloody energy crisis, everything. So what I think will happen in the next couple of years, which we're going to make a very good comeback. Just like every war or every depression that's happened in the world, mm. there's always a great comeback. Now, this is why I talk with a lot of bartenders, because and this is what everyone has in common. It's like, oh, but this, like, they'll work in a bar and they'll say, oh, this team is nowhere near the team that I used to work with. The team when I started was the best team that there ever was there. Yeah. And I'm not going to be biased, but if you ask me, each place I worked, which was the best team, nearly 100% of the time, it's the team I started with because that's the first impression you get, which it can be the case in a lot of times. Maybe the standards have gone down, but that first team will always make that impression of you. And I think a lot of people, when they have these new teams on them and they're like, oh, this team has got nothing on that team that I used to work with. I'm like, yeah, maybe that's right. But you're doing fuck all for them to make it how it should be. So if you're not going to lead by example, then why should they? Yeah. You know, attitude reflects leadership. So that's one thing that I 
think they should change. And also, you've you got to argue with your staff in a friendly way. Like, why we work so well together was if you disagreed with me, you would just say it. It doesn't matter the title, the position, or if I knew you had a better expertise on it or not. You would just say it. And, you know, we've had a few arguments and we'll have a lot more going into the future. <laughs> but... But, but then, then again, again it's also like, like I remember you saw because I used to demand a lot from you. So yeah. But um, hopefully we get to. I mean, we're get we're getting there. I think, like I said, after January we'll really see where things are going. So I think so we'll be in a good direction. The post COVID, should we say syndrome, wears off post COVID syndrome. I call it COVID trauma. Uh, COVID trauma. COVID trauma. Post COVID yeah. trauma. So yeah, we're, once we're once that wears off and things start going back to normal, yeah. I think. Well. Hopefully so. So, Boxy Brit, I'll be the end of it. Thank you very much for coming. You're welcome. And guys, just another reminder, busy Saturday, Friday shifts, you're just a bit too hungover and you don't have time to have your breakfast because your tube is only every 10 minutes. Have yourself a lovely gold riller. Remember guys, quite healthy for everything you've been doing the day before or what you have not been eating. Please have the gold riller. It was Sam's first time as well trying it today. And, it's not uh, bad. It's, uh, it's got a nice delicate flavor to it i was almost, I almost said delinquent but delinquent. <laughs> delicate very i meant delicate but yeah hope you can guys anyway thank, thank you very much guys subscribe and also like the video and hope to see you guys very soon thank you very much